Hello drummers and other creatures. Today we're going to take a look at a song called She Does It Right by the legendary Dr. Feelgood, arguably the progenitors of British punk music. Why am I doing that? I don't know. Because they, they have this sort of aggressive vibe about them. Uh, Wilco's guitar lick on this thing, apparently it's simple, but it sounds like a sort of samurai sword of music chopping up the ears or something like that. And um, guy on the drums chap called John Martin playing a really fast and furious groove. It's fairly straightforward, it's simple rock and roll, but it's the speed, the tempo of the thing that can get you. Uh, let's have a quick listen to what the thing sounds like. Something like that. Did I get it right? I hope. Some, something like that, anyway. Um, again, what we're going to look at here is quickly maybe go over the structure of the song, look at the sort of central structure of the drum beat that John Martin is playing. It's not the guy John Martin, the singer with a Y. It's another John Martin. But um, I, I made a little chart of the thing as well. I'll show you here. It, you're not going to be able to see it. I'll probably um, uh, attach it to my video if you want to take a look and follow the structure of the song. But it's pretty straightforward. We've got the uh, intro, which is eight bars long, and then it's the, the sort of the riff, as I would call it. Then we've got an eight bar verse, we've got an eight bar chorus, the first four bars of the chorus on the ride, then the second four bar chunk of the chorus is back on the hi-hat, everything else on the hi-hat in the verse and the chorus, uh, and then we've got the riff again. So we've got eight bars verse, eight bars chorus all together, four bar riff, two repetitions of the, the pattern, and then verse, chorus again. Then we go into the solo, which is again eight bars long, and we're playing on the ride, uh, but the last two bars of that, so we've got six bars of ride, two bars of floor tom, um, and that pretty much is, is that really, is some basic rock and roll sort of fills, there's a nice tom build up, and uh, I'll, I'll cover some of it, I guess, and some of it you can work out. But um, let's look at the main groove, which is the, the primary thing, and uh, let's see about how we deal with the tempo. Um, it's worth noticing that while the original recording, and if you look at any live performances of Feel Good playing this thing, it's pretty fast, and they, they maintain the same tempo more or less live on the clips that I've seen, but uh, if you want to find uh, something that's just uh, a little bit less speedy uh, in more ways than one, you can find um, a version of Wilco doing it with the legendary Norman Watroy uh, on bass and a uh, chap by the name of Dylan Howe on drums, who's a fantastic drummer, doing it a little bit uh, more recently on uh, one of Jules Holland's famous BBC thingies. Um, so that version is relatively leisurely, so if you want to play along, um, that's, that's a bit easier, it's a bit more relaxed. But we'll look at the speed of this in due course. Now, what's the, the, the two bar phrase that the drummer's playing throughout? It's pretty straightforward. Bar number one, we've just got bass on the one, the three, the and of three, and the and of four. So we get this thing. And then in the second bar, we get uh, the bass on the one and all the ands from the two ands. So one, and of two, and of three, and of four, we get this. When we put them together, we get this. Oh, no, we don't, we get this. Now, something's resonating here. The tempo, again, you saw my little demonstration, but the tempo we want to get this up to is something like. 
One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. So, when you play this, make sure that you're going to play the tip of the stick on top of the hi hats. Uh, it's very clear in the recording, the, the, you know, the original sort of album recording. That's what's going on. In some of the live clips, it looks like John Martin is digging in a little bit more, maybe playing uh, in the verses with the, um, the shoulder of the stick on the edge of the hi-hat. But I would just play on top of the hi-hat cymbals and try and keep it as relaxed as you can to let the stick give you a bit of bounce. Now, well, I'm French grip here, I've got my thumb on top and just a little rotation of the hand. Hold the stick in the best balance position you can find. So um, if, you, if you want to hold your stick way back here, it's going to feel really heavy. And maybe at first it'll feel all right, but after a little while, you might find that you're working kind of hard. So I prefer holding my stick in the balance point, which is about a third of the way up. And again, you know, really relying on bounce. If you, if you play German grip, if you like your hand on top, uh, maybe you even want that little whippy molary thing. But I'm, I'm finding I like French, really, for this uh, sort of playing, getting the speed up on my hi-hat. OK, so the trick here is first memorize the pattern, play it a good number of times so that you know you can kind of, you know, got it ringing in your ears so you don't have to count and think about what the bass drum is doing. If you practice this a little bit slowly as well, not only does it give you a chance to focus on your bass drum, but you can also practice your angry Essex scowl as well, something that uh, I like to practice as often as I can, to be honest. Um, and, and that's that. Once you've memorized it, then try to go for the speed. Now, if you haven't played something at this sort of tempo, I can't remember what it was, I think I worked it out, is it 160 something, 170 maybe? Um, but if you haven't played something before at this sort of tempo, you might find it rather challenging, in which case you're, you're gonna have to work your way up to playing faster. And uh, one of the things that, that I find is really helpful for getting that is to learn how to play the groove uh, as quarter notes, right? So you can play half the number of strokes on your hi-hat, and then you can swap between the quarters and the eights, so you allow yourself to have like a sprint where you're playing all of the notes, uh, and then you can relax a little bit by just playing the quarters. So, for example, I'm gonna play the, the two-bar phrase now, just playing quarter notes, and I'm gonna switch to eighth notes if, if I can get that right, okay? So, uh, I didn't practice this before. Let's have a go. See, uh, already my brain's thinking about things. So that's the thing with the quarter notes. I'm just playing one, two, three, four on the hi-hat. Now I'm going to mix the quarter notes and the eighth notes. So I could play, say, two bars of quarters, two bars of eighths. In other words, one riff's worth, riffs, riffs worth of quarter notes and one riff's worth of eighth notes, like this. And you find a, a tempo at which you can just about manage to keep the eighths going. And then as you go between quarter notes and eighth notes, the eighth notes feel a little bit like work. I mean, not really trying to like tense up and, you know, start sweating and, you know, feel like you're um, doing some very intense activity. The, the ideal place you want to be is where it feels a bit challenging, so you're not quite sure if you can keep it going nicely through the entire two bars of eighth notes, right? So you're looking for kind of the edge of your ability and learn how to relax into that and then speed it up a little bit once that starts to feel 
easier, right? Does that, I hope that makes sense, but you're looking to find that just the beginning of a crisis point, right? And that pushes your brain to kind of evolve and develop the ability to, to do the, the activity that you want to do. A lot of it's in, in the programming of the mind rather than your muscles as such, as far as I understand. Right, so that's, that's a way to work on the, the, the tempo of the thing. And um, I find that's really effective, whether it's going to faster eighth notes or even going between eighths and sixteenths if you're trying to learn, say, a one-handed sixteenth. Going half the notes you want to play as a kind of relax and then the full, the full whack as well, so to speak. Okay, so um, that's that covered, I guess. Now, when we uh, play our verse again, uh, la la la, playing on the top of the hi-hat and so on, uh, from the first verse this happens once, but from the second verse we also get like a little open hi-hat bark, which I'm, I'm doing a video or a couple of videos about as well at the moment, but uh, we get a hi-hat bark which happens on the and of three, just before the snare wax the four on the second bar. So it goes like this. Now, this also, if you're kind of at the tempo, but it's a little bit knackering, you can use that as an opportunity to rest because when you open the hi-hat, you can avoid playing the hi-hat again on the four immediately afterwards. So you get a little uh, quarter notes worth of rest essentially. So you would go like this. actually left a bigger gap than I intended just because I'm being demonstrative about keeping the stick away from the hi-hat. Um, let, let's do that at full speed and see if it makes sense. Did you see it? Yeah, okay. So really, really good way for taking a bit of a break when you're playing things that are a bit fast and you're feeling like, ooh, what's going on? In the chorus, first four bars of the chorus, we're gonna play the ride. And to my recollection, in the very first chorus, I think he sort of plays four and a bit bars. Uh, and I like to think maybe he went, ooh, I forgot that I'm going back to the hi-hat there. And so he's a little bit late the first time around, but after that, it's quite consistent. Uh, when you listen to the live versions, again, he does that really consistently. Four bars on the ride, uh, coming back to the hi-hat, and very little fillage uh, between those things. Um, I don't think he even crashes between the ride coming back to the hi-hat, even though there's an impulse to do it. I think I did that in my demo. So oh, mostly ignore me. Anyway, so in our uh, chorus, again, we're gonna keep the same bass drum pattern, and then let's move four bars ride, and then back to the hi-hat. I will fairly habitually play my hi-hat on the two and four. It's not really required. You're not gonna be able to hear the difference, to be honest, but, but I quite like doing it. So if you know how to do that, feel free to add it. Uh, let me challenge myself not to do it right now. Okay, so here we go. Oh, I think I just played eight times. You know, ugh, I wandered off there. Oh, that's not very good, isn't it? You don't want to hire me for a session. Um, I think I just did that eight times, didn't I? Because I sung the, um, the riff to myself four times in my head. So I was thinking four riffs instead of four bars. Let's try that again. came out better, didn't it? And you notice there's a, a little bit, sometimes he throws in an extra 16th, I think mostly in the um, choruses, but if, if you feel like you just want to add a little mm, je ne sais quoi, you can do that, yeah? So, it... something like that, an E or an and, R. 
have I covered everything? Ah, the last thing that we need to know, uh, or maybe, I don't know, do we want to look at the fills? Let's even uh, look at the fills. But um, before we do, uh, there are two guitar solos, and the same thing happens. We have six bars of the groove played on the ride, and then it resolves to two bars of floor tom groove. So we'll be playing the eighth notes on the floor tom, and as best I can hear, the bass is on the one in the and, and the three in the and, we will rock you style. So we get six bars of this. Now, let's see if I can count the bars right this time. Let's see if I can count the bars right this time. That's more or less what happens there. Yeah, eighth notes on the floor tom, bomb bomb on the bass. That's it, very simple. That's your guitar solos. Now, there's a bit of stop time, there's a few fills. Uh, again, the fills are like really straightforward rock and roll stuff. Um, one of them is just one E and two E and played right, left, right, I would guess, right, left, right, right, left, right, right, left, right, right, left, right. You can do that any way you like. Something like that. We've got some eighth notes. Nice build up. We've got, there's a few uh, instances where he just plays full sixteenths. Something like that. Straightforward. Um, I think we get that as well. Dug it up, dum. It's classic rock vocabulary, rock and roll vocabulary, really. It's sort of, um, I don't know, it sounds like he's, he's almost challenging sort of Earl Palmer, but just with a bit of extra aggression thrown in there. But if you, if you listen to something like um, Blueberry Hill by uh, Fats Domino, Earl Palmer, it's olden days, it's 6-8 kind of thing, 12-8, but it's actually, the drumming's incredibly aggressive and heavy on there. And then uh, I think it's something to do with the recording technology on some of that older stuff, but I think those guys are really laying into their drums, actually, and I always thought it's this kind of, ah, jazzy thing. Anyway, so uh, it feels like, you know, Dr. Feelgood is a sort of R&B vibe, I suppose, in the, in the old sense of it, in the, you know, sense of, like, Chuck Berry, R&B, Bo Diddley, that kind of thing. Uh, and it's just got that little bit of a sort of Essex grit and aggression that uh, makes it feel really, really good. Anyway, that really is the essence of how to play the song. You learn how to play that two bar phrase uh, and just get that, just play it a lot until you know that you can kind of add and remove a couple of bass drum notes here and there without losing the feel. Uh, and then work through the arrangement so that you can swap between the ride and the hi-hat in the verses and work on also playing the six bars of ride and two bars of floor tom in the uh, guitar solos. And then yeah, you're kind of pretty much done. Get a few fills in there and you're good to go. That'll be that for, I think, I'm, I'm trying to sort of do my videos just straight through now without any editing and whatever warts and all, just get on with it. Uh, so I don't know if that makes the pace too slow for YouTube or whatever, but uh, let me know what you think of this. Let me know if you feel like you, uh, you know, made sense of what I'm explaining here. I'm gonna add, as I said, um, that's it, I'll, I'll write out the, uh, the groove pattern. And also I've got the uh, quickie chart, as I showed you, I think earlier. Uh, and you can use that to follow structure of the song. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of insight into how to play that song, what to do about the tempo and so on and so forth. Now I think it's time to wrap this up. So uh, thank you very much for watching if you're still here. 
I really appreciate it if you subscribe, if you hit the like button, and uh, most importantly, if you comment on this video and let me know what you thought of this, whether it helped to illuminate something about drumming or um, you know whether you think I could have done a better job of it. Uh, also, let me know what you're interested in. Someone asked me about a feel-good number. I picked this as it's uh, rather fun, and uh, I made a video. So. Uh, you know, ask me what you'd like to hear about and I will try and oblige if I possibly can. Now, thank you very much. I think it's time to go off and practice.